There's an unknown saying that says the Bible doesn't need to be rewritten, just reread. We're going to study the scriptures today on Wednesday Night Praise, part two of What Did Jesus Do With the Cross? From Ephesians chapter two and some great gospel music coming up next on Wednesday Night Praise with the Spooner Church of the Nazarene. I love the thrill I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. What a sight just to see all the happy faces. What condescension, bringing us redemption. I need to read the words. That in the dead of night, no one faint hope inside. God's gracious tender, laid aside his splendor. Stooping to woo to win to save my soul. I'll sing the verse right this time. Oh, how I love him. How I adore him. My breath, my sunshine. My all and all. The great Creator became my Savior, and all God's fullness dwelleth in Him. Without reluctance, flesh and blood His substance, He took the form of man reveal the hidden plan oh glorious mystery sacrifice on calvary and now i know thou art the great i am oh sing it with me Oh, how I love him, how I adore him, my breath, my sunshine, my all and all, the great creator became my savior. And all God's fullness dwelleth in Him. Well, we are here on Wednesday night praise, the Wednesday before Easter, as we are talking about what did Christ do with the cross. Let's go back to our Sunday night notes. Let's bring them up on the screen right now. This is what part one was about, the first seven verses. In verse one of Ephesians chapter two, as we talked about what did Jesus do with the cross? If you were to look at a tree, a carpenter might say there's a lot of lumber to build a house. A logger looked at it, there's a lot of logs to sell. Somebody that did furniture, there's a lot of furniture that can be made. Somebody that cuts firewood says, man, I could heat my house for a winter. Jesus took a tree, made it a cross, and did something very beautiful. In verse 1, and I'm not going to review these. This is Ephesians chapter 2. I'm just reviewing our Sunday night notes. He made a way in verse 1 for us not to be dead in our sins, to give us a spring in our step and a song in our soul. I like what the unknown author says. Two things never live up to their claim circus and sin. Verse 2, he made a way so we don't have to be like the rest of the world. I can have hope. I don't have to be like the rest of the world that just lives for themselves. Not everybody does, but there's a lot. 
Chuck Swindoll says, you're a fool and a simpleton if you know what weakens you and you feed on it anyway. Verse 3, he made a way so we don't have to be in bondage to the sinful nature. Wow. Doesn't mean we can't sin. Doesn't mean we won't sin when we get our eyes off the Lord. But we can have victory. Verse 4 and 5, which I did spend a great deal of time on last time, says, He made a way for us to experience His love, grace, mercy, personally, in our own heart and life. I like what St. Augustine said. He loves each of us as if there was only one of us. Really, really like that. Because if you were the only person to ever give their heart to Jesus, in the history of mankind, really, I got ring around the collar. Sorry about this t-shirt. Um, maybe my wife won't watch this. But if you were the only person in the history of mankind to ever give his heart to Jesus, repent of your sins and believe on him, he still would have went to the cross for you. Verse 5, he made a way for us to be alive in our spirits. Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at. And it, one person said, when life kicks you, let it kick you forward. Verse 6, he made a way for us to have heaven in our heart. One man wrote, one can endure sorrow alone. One can endure, endure sorrow alone, but it takes two to be glad. I don't know how some people make it through life without Jesus. And verse 7, where we left off Sunday night, he made a way for us, for him to share everything. He shares everything he has with us. His kingdom, his love, his power. One person wrote, an unknown author, most men live on a cafeteria plan, self-serve only. <laughs> Jesus is very gracious. He's not selfish. And that's where we ended up Sunday night. And now it's Wednesday night, praise. Let's bring up the new list here as we do part two this Sunday night, Easter 2024. We will uh, do the final seven verses of this. But tonight's part two, verses uh, eight through 14. And we are in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm just going to pick up on verse 8. I have the New King James this time. And uh, verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, that is a gift of God. Wow. He made a way with the cross, Jesus Christ did, for us to have faith in something bigger, much, much bigger than ourselves. You know, Proverbs 3 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes because he has something bigger. He has something far bigger. The Bible says, I wish I had the scripture on the top of my head right now. I has not seen or ear has not heard what God has in store for his people. One man wrote, I can't pronounce his name, because of the cross, we bear one another's burdens and help carry one another's crosses. And when we do, God turns our joy into pain, or turns our pain into joy. Because we serve something bigger than ourselves. God is so much bigger. You know, I'm thinking of the story of the little boy that had the rock in the sandbox and couldn't move it. He was crying. Daddy, Daddy, I tried everything to get this rock out, and I can't get it out. My, and his dad came over and said, Son, you have not tried everything. You forgot about me. And his daddy picked that rock, threw it out of the way. Our Father in heaven, through his Son, Jesus Christ, and the power of his Holy Spirit, takes the rocks in our life and throws them away when we trust on, in him. Well, let's go to verse 9 of Ephesians 2. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. You are not saved by good works. It is the grace. When you say, Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. Come into my heart. Come into my life. I'm sorry for my sins. Well, a lot of people think that repentance, that's what that is, is some kind of work. No. If you're going to recognize what Christ did for you on that cross, if you're going to believe by faith that he died for me, did what I could not do for myself, 
I have to recognize that my sin put him there. And I really don't understand it if it doesn't leave me in a state of remorse. We are not saved by obedience. We are saved through repentance, through faith, and obedience flows out of it. You know, Victor Hugo once said, the supreme happiness of life is the conviction that we are loved. We are loved by a creator who loves us more than we could ever love ourselves. It's a free gift. I shared the story back in 97, I believe it was. I think it was the year the Green Bay Packers won the Super Bowl with Brett Favre. And I believe I was in Guatemala, not Guatemala, that was another trip, uh, the Bahamas with a bunch of Nazarene pastors from the district. And, and I remember being downtown with a couple other pastors and this man from the, I think it was the Freeport Island came up to me and this Bahaman guy, bah, Bahama guy came up to me, a resident, says, I want to give you a gift. So I took it, says, thank you. And he says, that'll be 20 bucks. I said, 20 bucks? I thought it was a, a gift. It was a conch shell. It's not a gift if I got to pay for it. I found all kinds of free ones down by the shore. I didn't give him the 20 bucks. Free gift. The Spirit comes in and gives us passion. We're not saved by good works. We're saved to do good works because the passion of Jesus is in us. I know there's a lot of well-meaning people that love the Lord and say, you just have to believe with mental assent. There's no such thing as repentance for eternal life. You should repent. But I tell you, you cannot recognize what Jesus did for you and truly believe in what he did for you on that cross until you first recognize it was your sin that put him there. I mean, you're not saying, Lord, I'm just sorry I got caught. No, Lord, I am sincerely sorry. Obedience flows out of a heart of repentance. So let's look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are saved by grace, by what Jesus did with the cross. We are saved by what he did on the cross, what he does in us, and what he does through us. You're not saved by good works. You're saved to do good works because the Holy Spirit is in you. Touch a power line sometimes, and sometime. You'll never be the same. That's how it is when, when Christ comes into your heart. What did he do here in verse 10? He made a way for us to be a part of his plan because he's flowing through us. I love Jeremiah. If you have your Bibles, I don't have these written down in my notes. I thought it might be better if we just do it together. So I'm in the book of Jeremiah way back in the Old Testament. Uh, chapter 29, I think most of you know where I'm going with this, that have studied it in depthly, in depthly, if I can even talk tonight, and you're watching Wednesday Night Praise, I'm Pastor Clifford Lurby of the Spooner Church of the Nazarene, glad you're along for part two, don't forget part three coming up this Sunday night, but I want to read Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, talking about you were prepared to do good works when Christ comes in you, this is what it says. Starting at verse 11. For I know the thoughts I, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And then he went on to tell the Israelites, I'll bring you back from captivity, from bondage. That's a promise today. We are prepared. God has got a future and a hope for us. Well, let's go to verse 11. Let's see what Jesus did with this cross in verse 11. I'm going to read it for you as soon as I go back there. And you know what? I lost my place, but we are in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in, if I ever find my place, we will be good. It would be nice if I was in the right book. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to begin now in verse 11. Paul writes, how Christ made, one, made us all one in Christ. Therefore, Paul says, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Let me read that again. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision 
by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. And then verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ with the cross made a way for everyone to have eternal life. Not just the Jews. He chose to work through the Jews in the Old Testament. And even though the Jews were God's chosen people in the Old Testament, remember, God always said if the alien comes in, not the ones from outer space, but the surrounding countries that want to serve the Lord, don't stop them. God reaches his arms out, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. The one who, who wasn't even in the Old Testament as the chosen people. But God still had compassion on the aliens and the foreigners. And he does today because the gospel is for the Jew and the Greek. For every single person. With the cross, he made it possible for everyone. Let's look at 2 Peter 3.9. 2 Peter 3.9, and that is where we would be going. Have your Bible with you. It says this. The Lord is not slacking concerning his promises, as some count slacking, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why hasn't Jesus come back? I think one of the reasons is because he wants everyone to come to repentance belief on him. He wants everyone to experience this gift of eternal life. It's for everybody, not just the Jews, not just the Nazarenes where I go to church or the Baptists on the road, but it is for everyone who's willing to say, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. I believe upon you. Thank you for your grace that's in my heart and life. You know, you've all heard that story. Maybe. If you've been around long enough, you heard it from me. I don't know if it's true, but I can imagine it being true somewhere. There was a scrubby, poor little cleaning lady who wanted to become a member of a great, big, prominent church. So this great, big, prominent church had a big, great, big, prominent pastor. And he asked her, Pastor, can I become a member of your church? And the pastor kept putting her off, putting her off because... Well, she don't fit the template of his great big church. Well, one day the pastor seen her cleaning an office, this scrubby little cleaning lady. And then pain, pains of guilt begin to flood his soul. And he says, did you ever have that talk with God about becoming a member of our church? And she goes, oh, yes, I did. Well, what did God say to you, said the pastor? And that little scrubby cleaning lady looked at the pastor and said, he told me not to get discouraged. I've been trying to get into that church for 20 years, and I can't get in there either. You know, I remember years ago at a church I passed, I'm not going to say where it was at. We brought some people in from a trailer court. It was a rough trailer court. But some of the people were coming to church. I wouldn't say a great number, but we had some coming. One person in the church came to me and says, you know what? I don't know how we attract such people to our church. I looked at this individual and says, said, they need Jesus too. With the cross, Jesus made it possible for everyone. Can we go to verse 12? See what Jesus did with the cross. We have another verse here. Verse 12 says in Ephesians 2, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of providence, having no hope and without God in the world. He's talking to the Ephesians. He made a way for us to have real hope. I don't know about you, but when I turn on the news, and I don't care if it's CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whatever news you're going to watch, I, can, I like to watch a little bit to see what's going on. But I can't sit there and watch it for hours on end because they just repeat themselves. But if you watch that all day and get engrossed in it, there's a lot of people that feel like they have no hope. My hope today isn't in who's going to be the next president. I have my beliefs on who I want to be next president. But I tell you what, 
if the man that I want to get in to be president in November, which would be January, doesn't get in, I still have my hope, which is the most important in Jesus Christ. I repented of my sins and I believed upon him and I'm living in his grace. I want to do my part to make this world a better place on this side of heaven. But my hope is not in Washington, D.C. My number one hope is in Jesus. I like what Paul said in uh, Timothy. If you have your Bibles and you, if, you're, if you have them handy, maybe you're driving and you don't want to, I'd prefer you to keep your hands on the wheel. First Timothy uh, 2.12 says, if I have the right scripture, and let me look here. First, Second Timothy, Second Timothy 2.12. All right, 2 Timothy 2, 12 says, If we endure, we shall also reign with him. And uh, if we deny him, he will also deny him. Verse 13, if we are faithful, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God's word is hope. He does not deny his own people. He does not deny us. His word is money in the bank. Many of you feel like you have no hope because so many people are shysters. So many people are crooked. But God's word, I love what it says. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. God is always faithful. You know, one man wrote to the sick, while there is life, there is hope. I don't know what the man meant by that, but I know as long as I have Jesus Christ in my heart, I have hope. Years ago, I think it was California, the University of Berkeley, did an experiment with Norwegian field rats. I think it was, no, mice. I don't remember, mice or rats. We'll say it was mice. And my family's big Norwegian, my mom's side. Big, big Norwegians. But mom always says I'm taking pills for it. But in this experiment, which is kind of cruel, they were going to see how long a mouse could swim before they die. You know which mice swam for hours and hours longer are the ones who every maybe 10, 15 minutes, they took the mouse out of the water, set it on the counter for about two or three seconds and put it in the water. You know, without Jesus, I'll just drown. But with Jesus, there's hope because the Bible says he'll never leave me nor forsake me. The Bible says he will never let me be tempted or tested or Anything beyond what I can bear. Let's go to verse 13, which we read a little bit earlier of chapter 2 of Ephesians. And it goes like this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. I look at that verse. Jesus, this is what he did with the cross. He made a way for us to come to God personally. I mean, he's telling these Ephesians, you were once far off. You had no hope in the previous verses. Because of the cross, that bridge. We can come to him personally, but he's not going to force us. The decision is ours. I like Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and have supper with him. Meaning, I will have a relationship with him. But it's up to you to open the door. One little Sunday school teacher says, when Jesus knocks on the door, what are you going to say? And the one little boy says, not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. That's how many of us are. And we still expect to be saved. We have got to make the choice. Am I going to believe on him? Am I going to repent of my sins? The choice is mine to let that grace flow in and out of my life. Jesus made the cross for a way to us, for us to come to him personally. It's not through church membership. It's not through baptism. It's not through communion. Those are wonderful things that show we love the Lord. And, and it represents what the Lord did for us. But they will not save us. Only a relationship with Christ. And the Holy Spirit confirms you can be assured. God, 
One person who was unknown wrote, an atheist is a man who has no invisible means of support. But because of God's word, oh man, thank you, Jesus. I can know him personally. Let's go to our last verse for part two, as we talk about what Christ did with the church. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. What did Jesus do with the cross? Jesus made a way for us to have peace and not hostility in the midst. If you watch the news and you see the different political parties going at it, doesn't seem like a lot of peace. Seems like a lot of hostility. But to know Jesus is to know peace. I like Philippians 4, 7. We can have peace that transcends all understanding and will guard our heart. There is just something about having the peace that only Jesus can give. He breaks down that wall of separation. Jesus Christ does. He did it at the cross. We tried everything, good works, good deeds, church attendance to get to heaven. But the only thing that will ever let us stand in the gates of heaven is Jesus Christ and belief and repentance upon his name. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It comes in and it fills you up and it will flow out of you. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, lest any man should boast. But you are created to walk in good works, not saved by good works, saved to do good works, because the grace of God is flowing in you. When you have that peace, you don't have to worry about being perfect. You don't have to worry about never making a mistake. Even sometimes we get our eyes off the Lord and sin. But because Christ is in us, we say, Lord, forgive me. Help me not to do that. We can have victory as we walk day by day with Christ. You know, I believe in the many, many centuries ago, King Hannibal, I don't remember what country was that. Some of you can text it in and tell me. They wanted to go down the mountain to defeat their enemy. But guess what was in the way? A rock. Like we would call today a big rock. Maybe we could call a kind of a wall of hostility. And his soldiers took picks and axes and tried to break that rock up and chip it down so they could get through and they couldn't do it. And finally he said, burn it. They were like, what? Burn it. So they cut a bunch of trees down. They call it felled trees. They heated that rock up so hot that crack. And that's what Jesus did at the cross with his Holy Spirit. He tore the temple curtain. No more do we have to live by the law, but by the grace of God. And that rock split apart. And he went down. And King Hannibal made his victory happen. Hey, Sunday night we're going to continue. I hope you've let Jesus come into your heart. I hope you've trusted him alone for salvation. Believed on him with a faith that comes in, takes root, and produces fruit. You don't have to worry about earning salvation. Don't even try because you can't. It is a gift of God. It comes in and flows out. If there's ever anything I can do or Brad or any of us that talk on here, Pastor Dave, just send us an email at SpoonerChurchOfTheNazarene at gmail.com. Remember, this Sunday, the 31st, I believe, Easter, I'll be back with part three and I'll finish these seven verses. If you want to see part one, go back to our previous Sunday night with Sunday night praise and I did the first seven verses. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being here today. I pray you'd make your word come alive, and I pray that you did with a cross, with a tree, what no one else could do. You brought an instrument of salvation, eternal life, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Be with anyone that has a need. Amen. I love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. Love the thrill that I feel when I get together with God's wonderful people. What a sight just to see all the